And we're going to talk a little bit about that because you kind of have to get a little bit of the, of the, the overview about what the book's about. He starts out <clears throat> and he dates the book. Each of these books have a date on them, and, and the dating is very important. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Idu, the prophet, saying. Now, you notice it's the eighth month of the second year of Darius. Go back to the book of Haggai where we just were. Chapter 1, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month. So Zechariah is going to start his prophecy two months later, the eighth, sixth, uh, Haggai is 6102. Zechariah is going to be 802. It doesn't tell the date of the month. If you come over to chapter 7, Zechariah chapter 7, Zechariah starts out, there are eight visions. He has eight visions at night. He records them, and then he records some of his messages. But chapter 7, verse 1, It came to pass in the fourth year of, of King Darius that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah in the, in the fourth day of the ninth month. So now this is September the 4th, but it's the, the fourth year. Now that's the last date in the book. There's obviously seven more chapters. But the, the last, last dated vision. So Zechariah is going to start in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the second year of Darius, just like Haggai did. Haggai is going to be, if you look at chapter, Haggai chapter 2, uh, verse number 20, the word, of, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the fourth and twentieth day of the month. And that was going to be the same year. So Haggai prophesies from, from uh, June the 1st of, of 02 down to uh, uh, September uh, of, of, of the second year of Darius. Zechariah begins his prophecy in the, uh, in the eighth month, which is what, August. When I'm using the names... He tells you the name here in a minute, and it's not the name that we use for a month, but I'm, I'm using our, you know, just the kind of calendar that we use. Somebody says, well, it's not accurate. Well, excuse me, but you, you, you go 500 B.C. and try to figure out what day of the week it was. I mean, you know, I'm just trying to give you some kind of relationship to, to compare between them in the way that we that we use. I, I know they didn't use our calendar and all that kind of business, but I don't know. People say, well, what month is it? If you, if you look up a Jewish calendar, if you go to the encyclopedia and, and look up a, Jew, a Jewish calendar, they'll say, for example, the month, the Abib, the first month on a Jewish calendar. They say March slash April. Now, how do, you have a cal- how do you have a month that's half of one month and half of the other? And so people say, well, you know, the Passover is on the 4th of Abib, 14th of Abib. So if, if, if it starts in April, and, and I say, just say April the 14th. <laughs> I mean, quit, quit trying to confuse. You know, you, you, it gets confusing enough as it is. Well, we want to be exactly right. Well, you know, blow it out your ear. I, and I don't mean that. Un, I just say that just to be sarcastic. But you're going to be so technically correct about a calendar that you don't you don't have any idea what it was anyway and it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference as far as if you missed a day or something and uh and then you're gonna you'll you'll overlook you know you strain it a gnat and, sw- and swallow a camel when it comes to the details of, of the text so these these dating things now the dates are important but in relationship to where we are you know, I'm just trying to say it in a way that maybe you'd understand. And that, if some scholar listens and that offends them, well, I already told you where to blow it. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord. So we're talking, Zechariah and Haggai were buddies. Come back with me to the book of Ezra. I just want you to remember that. And these two prophecies are placed next to each other for a, a reason, a doctrinal reason. Ezra chapter number 5, Ezra 5 verse 1, then the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Idu prophesied unto the Jews, 
that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the, of the God of Israel, even unto them. Come down to chapter 6, verse 14. And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered. By, by the way, in chapter 5, they prophesy, and Israel goes out, verse number 2, 5, 2. Then rose up Zerubbabel, and uh, the son of Shelchai, and, Je and uh, Jeshua, the son of uh, Jez Jezadok, and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Now, we studied that in Haggai. So the first thing they're going to do is go back and build the temple. And with them were the prophets of God, Zechariah, Haggai, helping them. And we saw in the book of, in fact, when we looked at this, this text last, you know, when we started Haggai, that there was great, that, that a opposition arose to the building of the temple. In fact, it gets delayed by a good, a good bit of time. And the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, Haggai says, we stirred up the people. So they're there helping spiritually, fortifying the, the, the remnant of the captivity that's gone back. Chapter 6, for Ezra 6, 14. And the elders of the Jews builded and they prospered through the prophecy of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Idu. So they did profit. They did help them. They gave them the spiritual encouragement to stir up their hearts to get the job done. They builded and finished it, finished the, 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 the foundation of the temple. Uh, according to the commandment of, of the God of Israel, and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the house was finished on the third day of the month, Adar. And uh, that's the sixth month, which is the, in the sixth year of the reign of Darius. So in March the 3rd of 06 of Darius, they finished the thing. So that gives you some kind of relationship historically to where we are when we're over here in, in the book of Zechariah. And what happened is they, they finished it. They finished the building. Haggai and Zechariah are there encouraging them. And we've already studied Haggai. Now you come back to Zechariah. So the timing here is important to understand. These are, these, Haggai and Zechariah are buddies. And they're going back to rebuild the, the, the people of the captivity have gone back, the believing remnant have gone back to the land. So they're regathering, picture the regathering of Israel, and they're rebuilding the temple. And the mandate is also, and Nehemiah will do this, rebuild the city of Jerusalem. It starts with the wall and so forth. Now, when he says in, in Zechariah chapter 1, in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord. It's important to notice and I've said this to you before, I pointed out when we get Haggai, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are what we call post-exile. Israel is carried into Babylonian captivity. The first nine minor prophets tell you it's coming. You're going to be carried into captivity. If you look down at verse number, uh, if you just keep reading, verse number two, the Lord has seen, have, have been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye, be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried. Now the former prophets are going to be Isaiah, all the way through Habakkuk. All those prophets cried to Israel uh, to, to get them to, to return. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways. And from your evil doings, that you did not, but they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers were, uh, where are they? What happened to them when they didn't listen? And the prophets, do they live forever? I mean, think about this, guys. You, you, your fathers wouldn't listen. I sent prophets and they didn't hearken to them. So where are they at? They're all dead. <laughs> it didn't help them, they died. Verse 6, but my words and my statutes, which I command my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? Look, they rebelled and they're dead, but where's God's word? It's still there. You know, he, he, Jeremiah says, what's the chaff to the wheat? <laughs> I mean, shall the... Unbelief of them make void the faith of God, make the faith of God of none effect? No. It doesn't, 
Look, it's the Word of God that doesn't change. People can believe it, not believe it. So they had God's Word. They, uh, verse, verse 6, But my words and my statutes, which I command my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And, and they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our dealings, so hath he dealt with us. So they went off into the captivity because God said they were going to do it. If you look down at verse 12, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast uh, this indignation these three score and ten years? That's the 70 years they go into Babylonian captivity. Zechariah is prophesying after the Babylonian captivity. Now, he's prophesying during the reign of Darius. So was Haggai. Haggai and, De and Zechariah are the only true writing prophets in your Bible that date their books based on the reign of a Gentile king. All the other minor prophets, when they dated them, it was always a king, one of the, in the reigns of, some, of one of the kings of Israel so that you would know they were pre-exile. Haggai and Zechariah are the only two that use a Gentile king to do that because now the times of the Gentiles have begun. The captivity is there. And the position Israel once held as the head of the nations, God's nation, have been taken away. Ezekiel said, the crown has fallen, has fallen. And they've lost that political headship, and he's given it to the Gentiles. And so Darius, and, uh, Darius is important, because if you come back over with me to the book of Daniel, the reason he's important is because Daniel, chapter 9, when you see it in Haggai and you see it in Zechariah, it, causes your, it should cause your mind to go back over here to Daniel. Because Daniel, after the 70 years are over with, and the Babylonian kingdom falls, the next kingdom, the Medes and the Persians, here comes Darius. And in Daniel chapter 9, in the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, if you go back to Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah 29, you'll see that God, through Jeremiah, long before they go into captivity, tells them, you're going to go to Babylon, and you're going to be there 70 years. And the 70 years are so that the land could have you out of it, so the land could you know, rest and enjoy your Sabbaths. Ezekiel 36 made it very clear to Israel that they had polluted the land with the blood of idolatry and the vain religious system, the blood of idols, the, the Baal worshiping. They'd, they'd made a mockery out of, out, of, out of the sacrifices of the temple, turned it into a vain religious system. And all of that had spiritually polluted the land. So God says, I'm going to have to take you out of the land. And there's a great phrase in Ezekiel 36 where it says, I'm going to treat you as a removed woman. And that's a, that's a reference back to the book of Leviticus. When a woman had an issue of blood, she was to be taken out of the camp for a period of time before she could come, because she would be unclean, then she could come back into the camp. And the way she got back into the camp first was she had to be washed. <laughs> and then some other things had to take place. And that's what, that's the, the wash in Ezekiel 36. He said, I'll sprinkle you a clean water and cleanse you from the, uh, the filthiness of your idolatry. That's a picture of what water baptism was doing, the washing of water by the, 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 uh, uh, the baptism of repentance for the mission of sin, the cleansing, the purification is the word I was looking for. And so anyway, there's, this, there's all these connections involved in those things that, that, that if you keep them in your mind, and I know that you do, uh, <laughs> um, they, they, they work together so that you kind of understand Israel's going to be out of the land. Why? Because they've polluted it. They're going to be out for 70 years. Now, after 70 years, it's okay to bring the people back into the land. But if people 
are spiritually corrupt and they corrupted the land. Now the land has had its Sabbaths and the land is ready to be used. If you put a spiritually corrupt people back in the land, what will they do to the land? Well, they'll mess it up again. So he says, before I'm going to put you back into the, I'm going to remove you, but before I put you back, I have to cleanse you. And so what Daniel is fixing to learn about is that there's not just 70 years for the removing of Israel out of the land, so the land would be cleansed, but there's going to be a, a longer period of time where he, where he removes the people and puts them through an education process whereby he cleanses them of that vain religious system, the idolatry, the Baal worship, the, uh, uh, the, the corruption spiritually, the spiritual idolatry in their heart. And so Daniel 9 is now going to talk to you about the time schedule uh, that Israel is now going to be under as far as their, their, the captivity. So you first, the captivity starts with the 70 years. Daniel, Jeremiah had told them going to be more nations than one. In Daniel chapter 2, the first thing Dan, Nebuchadnezzar has, you remember the, the vision Nebuchadnezzar had? The head of gold, that was Babylon. He replaced Israel with Babylon. In fact, if you, you're in Daniel, look at the very first verse of Daniel. This is a powerful verse. Uh, in the third year, the reign of, of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came the Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. And he carried in, in, into the land of Shinar, the, the, uh, to the house, which he carried in the land of Shinar to the house of his gods. And he brought the vessels unto the treasure house of his God. God literally gave Israel the throne of David unto the hands of a Gentile king. And what he's doing there, and we, I don't want to go through all the verses, but you go back over to Ezekiel and he talks about the crown falling from their head and literally God took that crown of them being the head of the nations and did exactly what Deuteronomy 28 said he would do, I'll make you the tail of the nations. Now, he said, I'll give it back to you one day, but I'm going to have to restore you. So when they go into captivity into Babylon, now the times of the Gentiles to rule the planet has come. Nebuchadnezzar sees that great image, which is a picture of the times of the Gentiles. The head of gold is Babylon. The, 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 the shoulders and arms of silver. That was Media Persia. Uh, if you come over to chapter 8 of Daniel. After the... After the oh, come back to chapter 2, I'm sorry. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Thou, king, sawest, and behold, a, greater, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was exceed excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Well, terrifying. This image's head was of fine gold his breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of, bra of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that was smote, I'm sorry, that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. So Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar the dream. And now he's going to say, here's, here's the interpretation. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the king of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, 
and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowl of heaven hath he given unto thine hands, thy hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art the head of gold. So there's no question about who the head of gold is. It's Babylon. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. And you're going down through then, you come to the stone, which turns out to be the Messiah who destroys all the Gentile roots, sets up the kingdom. Second coming of Christ. But between here, the captivity with Babylon, and the second coming of Christ when he comes back and establishes his kingdom in the earth, what you have is this, this, this Gentile kingdoms that are going to rule the earth. Babylon starts. Now the second one, the book, of, the book of Daniel will identify each of these kingdoms for you. So you, don't have, you know who the head of gold is because he tells you, Nebuchadnezzar, it's you. If you come over to chapter 8, if you look at chapter 5, the very last two verses, In that night was Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Midian took the kingdom, being about three score and two, two years old. So it's the, the Midians and it's the, the Medio Persians who take the kingdom from Babylon. Darius is, 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 in, is one of the kingdoms that, kings that, that does that. If you come to chapter 8, Daniel gets a vision. And he gets a vision about two animals, a, a ram and a goat. And the ram and the goat have a fight. Verse number 3, 8, 3. And I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. There's Median Persia. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth. So now you've got the ram and you've got the he-goat. And the ram and the he-goat, when they get together, they have a fight. And the ram gets destroyed by the he-goat. And, and you say, well, what is all that? Well, if you come down to verse number 20, uh, come to verse number 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and, he, and fell upon my face. And he said unto me, understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. So when is the vision aimed at? The time of the end. Okay. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright and said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For the time appointed, the end shall come. And the ram which thou sawest, verse 20, having two horns, are what? See how he tells you what it is? So who's the ram? Media, Persia. So you had Babylon followed by another kingdom that's Media, Persia. Now, the rough goat, verse 21, is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now, Bab Media Persia is followed by another kingdom, and he tells you here the one that takes Media Persia away is Grecia. And the first king of Grecia is that little horn. Now, who was that? Well, you, you don't get that out of Daniel, but you do know that from history. It's Alexander the Great. And by the way, verse 22, now that being broken, whereas four stood up of, uh, for it, Four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, and but not by his power. And in the latter times of their kingdom, when the transgressors will come to a full, now you're in, now you're in the seventh week of Daniel. 
And when you get to the seventieth week of Daniel, that's where those legs and feet come in during that period, the the, uh, the breaking of the four kingdoms. But we're not there yet in in, in, Ze- in Zechariah. That's further along. Where we are in Zechariah is back up here with the the uh, Medes and the Persians. Greece hadn't shown up for Haggai and Zechariah. We're we're back here in this in this phase, the second kingdom phase. So when we're studying Haggai and Zechariah, he tells us when he tells you this is Darius the king is is the dating system here. He's telling you we're in that second kingdom of Daniel chapter two. Now that puts you in the time schedule. Come over to Daniel nine helps you understand where you are in the time schedule. Because what, what, he, what he does in Daniel 9 is he tells you there is a, you got 70 years to cleanse the land. It's going to take 70 weeks of years to cleanse the people. It's going to take a lot longer to cleanse the people than it did to cleanse the land. Cleanse the land, all you have to do is take them out, let it rest. Let it fulfill God's command for it. But for the people, eh, it's going to take a little longer. They're a little harder-headed. And so he says in verse 24, Daniel 9, 24, and here's Gabriel talking to Daniel. He's giving him the information. And here's, here's what he tells him. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Notice it's determined upon the people and the holy city. What's his holy city? Jerusalem. So specifically on Israel and specifically on Jerusalem, there is a 70-week time schedule aimed at them. Okay? So what are we reading in Haggai? The people go back. What do you read in Nehemiah and Ezra? The people go back. What do you read in, in, in uh, Nehemiah? They build the city. So th- what they're doing in Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther is they're, they're, they're going to be involved in what this is talking about here. So you're going to have 70 weeks aimed at Israel, the people, and the land, the city. Now, verse, there's, there's the schedule. He doesn't just say 70 weeks. By the way, somebody says, well, how do you know it's a week of years? Uh, there's a whole lot of ways you can look at verses and say this, that, the next thing. But the easiest way to know it is that the, the 70th week in verse 27 is in the book of the Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, that 70 week is divided into two parts, 42 months and 42 months. It's called 1260 days and 1260 days. Now, if you take 42 months, multiply it by 30 day, 30 day months, which is what a month is in the Bible, you got 1260. If you had 1260 and 1260, if you had 42 and 42, you've got seven years. So it's easy to understand that it's a week of what? Well, you can have a week of days. Back in Leviticus, you could have a week of weeks. That's what Pentecost is. Uh, you could have a week of years. And you could have a week of weeks of years. That's what the year of Jubilee is all about. That's why Israel, that's what Israel hadn't honored. And that's why they spent 70 years in captivity, because they hadn't honored those, those Jubilee years, those 50th years. So in the Bible, when you say a week, it could be a week of a lot of things. Uh, it just means a group of sevens. In this case, it's going to be a week of years. And you know that from subsequent study. Now, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. So there's going to be a point here where there's a commandment that's going to say, go back and restore Jerusalem. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. So from there until Messiah the Prince comes, it's going to be 62 weeks. But notice what he does with those 62 weeks. Going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street should be built again and the wall in troublous times. So that 62 is, I'm sorry, that's 69 that 69 is going to be divided into 7 and into 62. The 7 
that would be 49 years. 69 weeks is 483 years total. You're going to have 49 years, and what, what does he say is going to happen then? The wall is going to be rebuilt. And this is going to be troublous times. Now, that's what's, what we're reading about in Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. That's that time period right there. They go back, they rebuild the wall, they rebuild the city, they get the commandment in Nehemiah from the king of Persia to go back, the clock starts, and for that period of time right there, there so this is where we are <coughs> when we're reading Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. These are, they're prophesying during this time period right here. The other minor prophets were prophesying back here before you got 70 years of captivity here when they go into Babylon. So they go into Babylon in captivity here. There's one, one phase of it. Then you're going to have a, another step in here, another phase of this 49 years. And this is where the prophets are. So you had nine minor prophets. Then you have the blank in here. And then you have Haggai and Malachi. Now, watch, what we, watch the rest of it. You go from here to Messiah, the prince shall come. So here Messiah comes. Now, the text doesn't tell you. It tells you what's going to happen in here. The wall going to be rebuilt, so forth, troublous times. It doesn't tell you anything about what's going to happen from here to there. As far as the information is concerned, that's silent. No information. That's why, and I, I pointed out to you over and over when we came through the, the minor prophets up to this point, he says, I'm going to go away. I'm going to hide my face from you. I'm not going to speak for you anymore. He said, you're going to go out of the land. You're going to be looking for the word of God, and you won't, you, you won't find it. There'll be a famine for the word. And God says, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to speak to you, give you information over here during that period of time. Now, that's why he writes down, that's why you have writing prophets in the Bible. That's why Isaiah through Malachi are written down. I've often thought, you know, you get to heaven, walk around New Jerusalem, you walk up to Obadiah and say, he says to you, how'd you like my book? And you go, hey, I know you wrote a book because Brother Rick taught us on Wednesday night. Most people won't even know Obadiah wrote a book. I've often thought, sit on a park bench, talk to Obadiah. Elijah walks by, and I'd want to say, hey, Elijah, why didn't you write a book? you got a lot more to say. You led a more interesting life than Obadiah did. We don't know who this dude is. But, boy, Elijah read a, led a real interesting life. I wish he'd have wrote a book. How about Elisha? That would been a good book to have read, too. You know, now I'm, I'm using this as an illustration. Don't be, you know, push it too far. But my point is, there are a lot of prophets in the Bible. There are 29 other men in the Bible named Zechariah, with 28 other ones. And, you know, would you like to hear from some of them? Well, you know, yeah. They aren't in the Bible. Why didn't Elijah write a book? Well, why? Because God didn't use him. God didn't tell him to write a book. That's why. He prophesied. He spoke in the name of the Lord. He's as much a prophet as Zechariah, Haggai, Malachi, or Hosea, or Amos. He didn't write because at that time they, weren't, they had open vision. God says, there will come a time I'm not talking, so I'm going to write it down so you've got it to read. He doesn't leave himself without a witness. So they've got it. But it's fascinating in here because for about 400 years in here, there's no, there's no revelation. The book of Malachi to the book of Matthew is about a period of 400 years, and it's just a blank page. Now, when the Messiah shows up, think about that for a minute. How old was Jesus when he entered into the ministry? Well, how old was he supposed to be? When a priest goes into the ministry, how old is he? He's a prophet, priest, and king. The priest is the only one that has an age on it. 
Book of Numbers says a priest enters into the ministry when? 30 years old. That's right. 30. Who guessed that? <laughs> so he, you expect him. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the prince, the, the priest sitting on the throne. So you expect him when the Messiah is going to show up. You're going to say there's going to be a 30-year period of time there. He's got to minister for some time. How long did he minister? Well, he ministered for three years. So now you've got 33 years. So if you add 400 and you add 33, you've got 433 years. If you subtract 49 from 483, you know what you get? You get 434. You say, but wait a minute. If you've got 400 years of silence, Messiah shows up and then he, he, and then he ministers. He speaks for, he is the word. Okay, and he speaks for 33 years, that'd be 433 years. That's right, but in Malachi chapter 3, come over to, you're in Zechariah, look at Malachi. Malachi 3 comes along and tells you, verse 1, Behold, that's, this is the Messiah, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. So before the Messiah shows up, he's going to send a messenger, John the Baptist. Isaiah 40 says he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Malachi 3, Mark 1 says he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He's the messenger come to prepare the way of the Lord. John the Baptist was six months older than the Lord Jesus Christ. His daddy was a priest. His mom, they're all, all, all Levites. He enters into the priesthood at what age? What did we just say? Y'all, y'all, this, is, this, is, this is a memory test. He enters into the priesthood, the ministry, six months before the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have 33 years of the ministry of Christ, add six months on for John the Baptist, what do you have? We have 33 and a half, which is equal to 34. Did you know I, I, I was, uh, we, I took my wife up to Wisconsin the other day. She'd go see a doctor. And we're riding up through Fox Lake, the chain of lakes up there. And they got boats everywhere. You know, that's, that's, I can't go places like that. I, I, my lust factor just gets the phew. You know, <laughs> the verse talks about a man not lust, looking at a woman to lust after. I look at a boat and I start lusting. You know, I say, I got you know, to not do this. If you see, they had a boat, it was on a side of a boat, said 22 footer. Now, if you go buy a 22 foot boat, if you take a tape measure and measure that thing, the, the, the keel of that from, 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 from um, stem to stern, you know how long it'll really be? 21 feet and 6 inches. Because legally, you can name it, you can, you can claim the length to the closest half foot. So if you're going to build a 1,000 boats and you can save six inches on every boat, would you do that? Well, they would because they do. So if you say 33 and a half years, it is normal to say, well, how old are you? Well, you've already, you've already, you've already clocked 33. You're in your 34th year. You're just only halfway through it. I'm just saying that's where, the, that's where the time. So you have the seven year, seven weeks, 62 weeks, but that 62 weeks has this period of nothing until Messiah shows up. And that's where that 483 years comes in, the, the seven and the 434. And there, where we are with, with Zechariah and Haggai, we're right in here. In fact, we're at the beginning of this. We're only like... Four years into it. So you're going to get some information. For Israel, as they return to the land, as they begin to do what ultimately they will do, that encourages them, fortifies them to put themselves back into the land. And what happens in Haggai is he, 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 he tells them, ultimately, I'm going to restore that temple and the glory of it. In Zechariah, he's going to give you a series of visions and messages that link 
the prophecies back here that he writes down with the end. And Zechariah, really if you take the book of Daniel back here, which is where this information is in Daniel back here. Well, you, in Daniel, you get, the, you get the time schedule, you get the kingdom layout, the whole, all that kind of stuff. You get over here, you're in the book of Matthew when Messiah comes. Then you have the seventh week of Daniel in here and the second coming of Christ, and the book of the Revelation is over here. What Zechariah does is it links Daniel with Matthew, the first coming, and then it links Daniel with the seventh week of the second coming. And so there's a linking, probably, someone said here to me tonight that when we started the Minor Prophets, they were looking forward to studying Zechariah the most. And that's probably just an instinctive recognition is that there, are, there, there is a linking together of details that Zechariah does sort of bring these kind of things together in a like a bridge between them, so that Daniel is not standing out there by itself, but that it has a clearly all four of the pictures of, of, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the king, the servant, the man, and, and, and God are found in the book of Zechariah. The details about the seventh week of Daniel, the destruction of the Gentile, uh, these Gentile kingdoms and so forth, and the establishment of the kingdom are detailed for you. And what he's going to do is take some of those visions in Daniel and flesh them out in a way that when you get to the book of Revelation, you're going to say, ah, ah, okay, here's, you're not going to be left to, to nothing when you get to Revelation. You're going to have some of these things fleshed out so that when you get there, you'll have a, you'll ha you'll have an, a study aid to go back to and draw from. Now, let me do just one other thing before we quit, just because of time. It's important to follow the order of the books in your Bible. I said to you many times that one of the things that years ago helped me to understand the, the issue about the King James Bible being God's Word, that God had put His Word uh, in a, in a uh, positive, supernatural way together, in a spiritually designed way, and that you have it in your Bible. It, one of the things that, that undergirds that is the, is the, uh, uh, the unity and the way the Bible is put together. Your Bible is divided, your Old Testament. You know the design we, we go through all the time in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the earth of Minister Christ, book of Acts, fall of Israel, salvation, Gentiles, so forth. The Old Testament has exactly the same kind of a design. It starts out in the books of Genesis through Deuteronomy. There are, your Bible starts out with history. And that history will take you all the way from the beginning, Genesis to Deuteronomy, all the way through to, uh, to the, end of the uh, end of the Old Testament time period. The books we're studying at the end of the Old Testament are books that relate to the, uh, the history uh, and the post-exile. You start with Joshua, And then you go through the book of Esther, and these books are called history. That's the history books of the Old Testament. There are 17 of them. There are five written by Moses. There are 12 that are history of Israel going into the land. These books are divided into two sections. There's nine of them that are pre-exile. There are three that are post-exile. Now, Genesis, these, these all have a doctrinal connection, but just remember that there's five of them. The book of Joshua, what does Israel do? They go in and inherit the land. You want to see Israel's inherit? Joshua begins with the Lord God of all the earth taking his ark and his people, going across Jordan and announcing his presence in the land. And number says he goes in to dispossess those Gentile kingdoms, throw them out, and put his people in. And in Joshua, you see the Lord, Jehovah, the Lord Jesus Christ, taking the land, the Lord God of all the earth. Now, once they're in the land, 
the book of Judges, immediately says, when they got in the land, the next generation, you know what they did? They worshiped and served Baal. They got polluted by the vain religious system. And Judges chapter 2 says they served Baal and Ashtaroth and so on and so forth. And so God's judge, the first course of judgment came on them. He told them back here in Leviticus, you keep my statutes, I'll bless you. You don't. The contract is you get these five courses of judgment. Each course is remedial. That's the reason we call them a course. He said, I'll punish you seven times. If you hearken, if not, I'll do it again, that class. The first one begins in the book of Judges. Now, something happens as that first course comes. Because the second course doesn't begin until 1 Kings chapter 12. You say, now wait a minute, why would you have hundreds of years between the beginning of it and the second one? And what's all that stuff in between? There's a thing Isaiah calls the sure mercies of David. And it really is what's going on back here. Because what God does is he, we read in in Habakkuk, he's slow to anger. (laughs) He punishes Israel, boom. And then he backs off and he says, you know, that's why it's called judges. I'll send you a deliverer. Watch, I'll punish them. I'll punish you. I'll bring the Gentiles in. They'll take away your crops. They'll take away your liberty. They'll do everything that first course said. And then I'll send a deliverer. You need a deliverer. I'll send a deliverer. And that's what judges did. Gideon's the great deliverer. Then he said, by the way, when those Gentiles rise up and whip, and whip you, steal us to do all that stuff, and I deliver you, I'll do something else. I'll send Samson. You know what, remember what Samson did? He didn't just deliver Israel. He destroyed. He said, I want to avenge my, God's people against the enemy. And so what you see in the 13 judges that go through there is deliverers and avengers. And God said, you know what you need when you're under that course of judgment? You need somebody to come deliver you and to avenge your, deliver you and then destroy your enemies. What comes after Judges. Ruth. What's Ruth about? That's the great book of what? The Romance of Redemption. The Kinsman Redeemer. There's Ruth. During the time of the judges, here comes Ruth. Where is she at? She's right there. Because what's God going to do? Before he's going to deliver them, before he's going to avenge them against their enemies, he has to provide them a Kinsman Redeemer. Then you have First and Second Samuel. And the first part of 1 Kings. And when Samuel, 1 Samuel shows up, what does Israel say? We want a king like everybody else. And so God says, okay, I'll give you a king after my own heart after their king messed up. And here comes David. And David, became, he makes the great kingdom covenant with David. And God says, I'll give you a king, and here's who he's going to be, and it's going to be his seed that's going to sit on my throne, and David the king. Well, David was a bloody man. David said, I want to make a house for you to live in, God. The Lord said, you can't do that because you're a bloody man. You're type of the first coming. I'll need, a, I'll need your son who will be type of the second coming, and he'll build my house. And I'll bless Israel with all the blessings that I promised them through him. So what you get with David is you get a king. With Solomon, you get a blesser, the blessing. And what God's doing is telling Israel, here's what I'm going to do to get you out from under the curse of your law breaking. I'm going to provide you a redemption through a kinsman redeemer. I'm going to Deliver you from your enemies. That's what David, uh, John the Baptist's daddy said. He's going to save us and deliver us from our enemies. I'll destroy your enemies. I'll avenge you against them. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. 
I'll come and be your king, and I'll be the one that causes the blessings to flow. That's why you read Psalm 132. He's the king sitting on David's throne, and Psalm 133, the blessings flow down from Zion, flow out from Zion. Those five things, five things, those five things Israel gets instructed about. Then Solomon goes bad. Solomon turns into a picture of the Antichrist, 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 13, of all things. There's a paragraph mark. And at that point, Solomon goes off the rail. It becomes a picture of the Antichrist. And you go through the text, you see he becomes identified with 666 and so on and so forth in the Scripture. And the kingdom is divided. That's course number two. Then course number three, four, and five all take place during that period, during, during, first, during first and second kings. So by the time you get to the end of this thing here, uh, the, the, the end of, of uh, second Chronicles, and by the way, Joshua to second Chronicles was 12, Esther, uh, Ezra to Esther, there's three. By the time you get to Second Chronicles, what's happening? He's no longer the Lord God of heaven. Now he's uh, the Lord God of all the earth. Now he's the Lord God in, of heaven. He's left. He's departed. He's done what Hosea 5 said he was going to do. He's abandoned them, gone away exile. Now he's the Lord God of heaven. And they're down here, and they go off into captivity, carried out of the land with the promise that I'll bring you back. That bringing them back, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Ezra, they come back and rebuild the temple. They regather the nation. It has to seek ye first the kingdom of God. They regather the nation around the temple. Nehemiah, they rebuild the city. Esther, isn't that a wonderful book? Do you ever, you ever just enjoy Esther? God's name's not an Esther at all. People say, it shouldn't be in the Bible. But his handiwork's all over it. Esther is a picture of, if Ezra, if Ezra is the, the, the um, regathering of Israel, and Nehemiah is the rebuilding of the city, Esther is that resistance of the little flock against the satanic policy of evil where they defeat the adversary's attempt to destroy them. Do you know the, the, the term Jew is found the first time in your Bible in the book of Esther? Where they were trying to destroy, Haman was trying to destroy the Jews. And the result was at the end of Ezra chapter, Esther chapter 8, is all the people wanted to become Jews. <laughs> and it's a picture of them resisting. All of that, my point to you is the, the book's, the way they're laid out, tell the story doctrinally. Now, when you after the history books, there are the books that contain the heart. What is it that in the heart of that believing remnant that allows them to get through there? And that's what Job, the Song of Solomon, does. And then you have the hope of Israel, Isaiah through Malachi. But you go Isaiah through the book of Daniel... There's 17 of these, by the way, 17. There's five of these. Isaiah to Daniel, the major prophets. Then you have Hosea to Malachi, which are the, the minor prophets. But the minor prophets, there's 17 of them. I'm sorry, there's 12 of them. They're in five. They're in nine. Hosea to Habakkuk. And then you've got Haggai to Malachi. These are pre-exile, just like these books are pre-exile. And these are post-exile, just like these books are post-exile. And just like Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther are post-exile, they'll match Hosea, Zechariah, and Malachi over there. There's a balance 
in what's going on here. Don't miss the fact that this stuff isn't just thrown in your Bible for no reason. Now, we're going to go through the book of Zechariah, and I'm going to tell you probably more than any place I've ever done this that I have no idea what that passage is about. And when I say that, I'm pretty confident nobody else does either because I've tried to find out from everybody I can find out about what it, what it is. There are some things in these passages that Daniel chapter 12 tells you are not going to be clear and plain until the end. Okay, I'm all right with that. But I'm just as nosy as anybody you know, and I like to try to figure it out if I can. So I've, I've told you all along, these minor prophets, we, every detail might not be exactly In fact, I can guarantee you every detail isn't right exactly. But we can get in the ballpark. Okay, that's how you get in the ballpark. You need to know where the ballpark is. And so we're in these post-exile books that are designed to give Israel, back here during this period of silence where he's not going to talk to them until John the Baptist shows up, some information that prepares them so that when that messenger shows up, they know who he is. Okay? <sighs> okay. Now, we, we studied, we looked at one verse in Zechariah, and all we got was the date, but I want you to get that. Now, we'll start next week, do the verses, you know, in, in some seriousness. But if you, can, if you can keep in your mind, and we're going to study 14 chapters, and you have to keep it in your mind all that time, it's going to be hard, but I'll keep reminding you, if you keep in mind where you are on the timeline, because that's going to affect how you understand what you're reading. Babylon's already over. Media Persia is there. So when we're going to study Zechariah, he's going to look to the future from Media Persia. He's not going to repeat about Babylon. That's over with. He's not going to repeat about Persia taking over Babylon. That's over with. We're going to be looking to the future. Okay? All right. Praise the Lord. Nice to see all of you tonight. Nice to be seen, isn't it? <laughs> I was telling Debbie this. I, I got a letter this week. You know, we, I, I mentioned Sunday. I got the. Uh, you were telling about the guy in death row, people in death row praying for us, and that's encouraging. I got a letter this week from a fellow. He's in prison, and he said, "I want. I just want to thank you for the transcripts that you send us of of Grace School of the Bible." And he said, I, I read them every night. We have a meeting in my cell block, and I read them the transcripts. <laughs> okay. I, you know, and I thought, that, that's interesting. We, well, they are, you know, they're, they're transcripts of your talking, so it, it does probably read okay. I think, well, that, that's, that's, that's called dedication. And, you know, you appreciate people do whatever they do, ever how they do it, so... At least we're, we're finding usefulness in the jails and prisons of America. Okay. Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness. We thank you for the privilege of looking into your word. And to be fascinated by your mind, your thinking. And to know that we have the privilege of serving you. We pray we might walk in a way that honors you. We pray that in our Savior's name. Amen. All right.